thank you very much, Ahmed. I will go directly uh, into the presentation. This presentation seeks to identify the legal framework that allows discrimination against Christians in Sudan and how and why it was allowed to replace a legal system that was neutral with regards to religion. The main target of that framework is to limit, if not to eliminate, any real chance of the religion, of that religion, I mean Christianity, to grow. It does so despite the constitutional provisions upholding freedom of religion and the very tolerant brand of Islam adopted by a majority of Muslims in Sudan. I, I need to say something because uh, I need to say something that there is no other uh, people more toler tolerant than the Sudanese Muslims. We have, to, we have to have this clear. This I know, this I'm speaking now from experience. I have never ever faced any incident of discrimination against myself. But the law is something else. We need now to look into the law. Uh, diversity and the state. Sudan is religiously a very diverse nation. All previous constitutions for, for those who are not Sudanese, we had six, six constitutions in the brief time of independence. That was six constitutions in 60 years, average of 10 years per constitution. So all previous constitutions granted unrestricted freedom of religion. And that was never a problem for the Sufi brand of Islam, embraced by the majority of the population. However, since the independence of Sudan, discriminatory laws in favor of Islam were allowed to creep into the laws of the land. That was gradual and largely unnoticed and was still naively regarded as only natural manifestation of the identity of the nation. The problem did not come from religion, but from politics. Coming out of the colonial rule, the new rulers of Sudan had to face a serious mutiny in the south, which they failed to put out militarily and more drastically to address the roots of the problem causing it. Falling under the influence of the rising Arab nationalism of the time, the political leaders of the country believed that a nation can have only one identity coming themselves from the mainstream culture, they identified Sudanese identity with Islam and Arabic culture. They have sought to build a nation around one religious, cultural, and if possible, ethnic identity. That is why they were suspicious of the impact of cultural or religious differences on the unity of the nation. This suspicion was more religion related in the troubled south of the country. The civil war was blamed on the British who allowed the south to keep and develop an identity that was different from the identity of the Muslim Arab North. They blamed the closed door ordinances of the 90s and 30s of last century for that civil war. They thought that by banning northern Sudanese from entering or working in the south, the, ordinance, the ordinances prevented them from spreading Islam and Arabic uh, culture in the south, and that was the main cause for the problem. This has led to the erroneous conclusion that diversity is the problem, and the solution lies in its elimination. More specifically, in making, reinforcing 
the South to adopt an Arab Muslim identity. This misconception led to the drastic inability to manage diversity, which ultimately resulted in the secession of the South. In 1958, the first of the three military coups Sudan has witnessed since independence took place. Though the regime established by General Aboud was very secular, it was influenced by the political thought of the time into believing religious differences was the main threat to the unity of the country and blamed the Christian missionaries for the unrest in the South. That belief remained with all those who succeeded Aboud in ruling the country. No wonder then that civil war which started few months before independence has continued up to the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in 2005. The Addis Ababa Accord of 1972 stopped the war briefly by granting the South regional autonomy, but it lasted only 11 years, and in 1983, the civil war resumed. The tension started when the Southerners believed rightly or wrongly, that the government of the North, following discovery of oil in the southern region, was tampering with the borders to claim some of the newly discovered oil fields to the North. The last straw was the government's resolution to divide the South into, true, into three regions. Few months later, any hope of avoiding a full-scale civil war was eliminated by declaring Sharia as the law of the land. The policy adopted by all governments since independence, with few short-lived exceptions, was to try to unite the country by assimilating the minorities into the mainstream culture, a policy that never worked and that only produced war, first in the South, and later into different areas of the country. As it became apparent that it was impossible to achieve peace from that position, the government was forced to accept diversity. As a fact, the Constitution needs to address. Thus, the Constitution states, we are speaking now about the Constitution of 2005, the Republic of the Sudan is an independent, sovereign state. It is a democratic, decentralized, multicultural, multilingual, multiracial, multiethnic, and multireligious country where such diversities coexist. Uh, remember that, please, throughout uh, the paper. It, it took the northern leadership of the country all the 50 years of independence to acknowledge that simple and obvious fact. However, the interim period would show that the government was never ready to go any far further than paying lip service to that diversity. Now, uh, let us examine law directly curbing spreading Christian beliefs. Uh, the suspicion of the successive government of Sudan toward diversity expressed itself as early as 1957, when Christian mission schools in the South were nationalized, and foreign missionaries were expelled from the South in 1963-64. In 1962, the Controversial Missionary Societies Act was promulgated uh, by uh, the dictatorship uh, that was ruling Sudan at the time. It remained in force until it was repealed by the Society's Registration Act 1994. Through, it remained in force through two popular uprisings that w w both of them was motivated by the escalation of war in the South. That shows you how oblivious the leadership uh, 
was to, to, to the main cause of the problem. Missionary Societies Act 1962 is an example of the law that restricts freedom of worship and freedom of religion, which necessarily include, includes the right to express one's religion and to proselyte. The said act was decreed by the Military Council of General Abud. The act acquired, required, sorry, any missionary society and any member thereof before doing any missionary act in the Sudan to obtain a license to do so and conduct its activities in accordance with the terms of the license. The license expires every 31st day of December, but may be renewed for a further period of one year on application made at, a, at any time before it's expired. And I'm just trying to, 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 to say the most important provisions of them. The President of the Republic, that was later uh, amended to, to, to put the President of uh, the Republic uh, instead of the, uh, the Military Council, uh, may at any time revoke or suspend a license. Missionary, missionary societies are prohibited from doing any missionary act in places other than those specified in the license. They are not allowed to do any missionary act towards any person or persons professing any religion or sect or belief thereof other than that specified in <coughs> the license, in, in, in its license. They should not even practice any social activities except within the limits and in the manner laid down by the regulations made under the act. That was made by the Minister of Interior Affairs. Now, <coughs> though the act never named any particular religion, the license granted under it did. The law does not provide for different provision on account of religion, but in practice, a world of difference exists. While Christian missionary societies are subject to serious vetting before granting the license and a close uh, mon close monitoring of their activities thereafter, where a strict observation of the restrictions in the license are expected and enforced, Islamic missionary societies licenses are being readily given and renewed. The case of Islamic Dawah organization is an example we need to look into. Sec section three of uh, the regulation of Islamic Dawah, Dawah is an Arabic work, and I really didn't, couldn't translate, <coughs> embraces the spreading of Islam credo and Sharia among non-Muslims as an objective of the organization. That section made it necessary for the organization to register under the Missionary Societies Act before starting its activities in Sudan. However, though the Islamic Dawah organization did obtain the necessary license, it never took the condition therein seriously. <coughs> so for many years, it stopped renewing its license. In 1987, following the downfall of Nimeri, the Attorney General decided to apply the law on the, or on the organization. So he ordered its activities to be suspended. That was done in crucial time for the organization when a board of trustees meeting was scheduled to convene soon and some imported commodities were at the airport. So the organization appealed, but the Supreme Court confirmed the general decision action. Now, that was taken care by a separate act. In 1990, 
the, uh, the Islamic Dawa Organization Act was enacted. This is a special law for the special, this special organization. To take it outside the, 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 the act governing Christian uh, missionary uh, organization. Now, according to that act, there is no restrictions about, uh, about uh, spreading Islam anywhere in the country or with anybody. But the most important thing, organizations building and real estate are not subject to nationalization, seizure, or search, except with its content. The organization archives, correspondence, and parcels enjoy immunity from being searched, opened, or confiscated, except with the permission of the organization. <coughs> The government should facilitate the organization, postal, telephone, cable, and wireless communication. Property, movable, and means of transport of the organization are not subject to search or seizure. The, the law actually gives the organization uh, immunities and privileges quite similar to those given to uh, foreign embassies. Uh, so uh, this uh, we, we we go back to the Missionary Societies Act. It remained in force until it was replaced, repealed, and replaced by Societies Registration Act 1994, which was in turn replaced by the Humanitarian Voluntary Work Act 2006. Uh, the, this act uh, of 1994 allowed religious groups to engage in a wider range of activities. However, they are subject to the same restrictions placed on non-religious uh, uh, organizations. Now I'm trying to, to go more quickly. No problem. Now, um, in 1980, another law was enacted. That is Awqaf and Religion. I'm sorry, some of the words I don't know yeah. <laughs> English. And endowment, yeah. public endowment uh, doesn't really, does it give the same meaning? OK. <coughs> OK. Um, at present, uh, you see uh, religious organization, organizations are under uh, the supervision of the council formed by that act. The, the, the council created by the AUKAF Religious and uh, Endowment, okay, uh, and the Religious Affairs Act 1980 is not <coughs> a neutral body <coughs> as far as religion is concerned. In fact, according to its formation and objectives as laid down by the law, the council is Islamic body, seeking to guide the nation to achieve the Islamic way of life. It says so. It's, uh, section 3 says, it strives in this field to preserve the cultural identity of the nation and direct it to achieve is the Islamic style in life. Uh, <clears throat> as far as Christianity is co concerned, it is entrusted, the council is entrusted with the power to patronizing Christian affairs and other religious and good beliefs in cooperation with the public organization and institutions in the field. Uh, one should say that the use of the word patronizing in the English version could be blamed on translation, uh, n not, not, not the act itself, as the word used in the Arabic version is ri'aya, which emphasizes care and protection. <coughs> However, the point is a non-Christian council is entrusted with 
wide powers over the Christian religious institutions, including general supervision of religious institutions and places of worship and organizing the activities and employing them in the most ideal way and uh, uh, other. Uh, it, is, it is full supervision of what is going on in churches and, uh, and other uh, Christian organizations. <clears throat> the council established a section for churches' affairs in the ministry that limited its activities in the beginning to helping churches in their dealing with other governmental departments. However, that changed lately when the section was flooded with security officers who turned its main concern to mo monitoring and supervising the Christian institutions. The general atmosphere now is that of suspicion between this section and churches. <coughs> now, um, the family law, because um, uh, as we learned today, is discrimination is, is, not by, is not just directing things against uh, the minority, but by favoring majority as well. So <coughs> the, the, the family law in Sudan uh, actually comprises two different systems, one for the Muslim and one for the non-Muslims. Uh, the one governing the Muslim family law uh, uh, is uh, uh, now is, uh, is actually a law promulgated by uh, the legislature, while the, sex, the, the other part governing non-Muslims are actually no more than customs and customary law, and we are going to examine that briefly. When the, when the British conquered Sudan, the southern parts of Sudan was inhabited by pagans. Uh, missionaries were allowed to provide certain needed services, mainly in the healthcare and education fields. Missionary work resulted in conversion to Christianity of considerable section of the animist tribes. The British rule attracted a number of Christian immigrants from Europe, mainly Greece, Armenian, and to a lesser degree Italy, and the Middle East, mainly Egypt and Syria, who started small business or joined the newly formed civil service. The Christian immigrants soon became part of the social life in different parts of the country. Those immigrants brought with them into the country their churches, not only to worship God according to their own beliefs, but also to organize their family lives according to the ecclesi uh, ecclesiastical rules of these churches. The British enacted certain laws that uh, concerned themselves of organizing certain aspects of the family law of the increasing non-Muslim population. Those laws are the Non-Muslim Marriage Act, 1926, the Official um, uh, Administration Act, 1925, the Wills and Administration Act 28. One should hasten to say that mo the most important one of them is the Non-Muslim Marriage Act, which deals with forming the families and as such is crucial for the community, uh, continuity of the community. The other two acts are concerned with succession of property, inheritance, and so, so we are going to ignore them. And they are left actually to the communities without interference of the state, no doubt about this. Now, <clears throat> the Non-Muslim Marriage Act, 1926, uh, has the, the following features. It, it actually, the main, it, it is actually uh, about the formality of concluding and celebrating a marriage. But it has very uh, insignificant uh, substantive uh, 
provisions. I will say that briefly. Firstly, it invalidates marriages on account of close blood or marital relation, which is common to all uh, legal system. And uh, it also uh, uh, invalidate marriages on account of invalid consent, unless the objecting parties later behavior showed consent, which is also something. Uh, and it sets minimum age for qualification to get married, which is, uh, so uh, w what I'm saying is that this, uh, uh, other, uh, other provisions of the act deal with the formalities of concluding and celebrating marriages, as I said. Uh, but the act actually establ established civil marriage and not religious marriage. So uh, this uh, religious ma marriages for non-Muslims were catered for by the act, but only as an exception. To the, uh, to the act, act's provisions. So section five of the act stipulates that upon the application of the recognized head of representative of any religious community in the Sudan, the minister of the interior shall have power by order published in the Gazette to direct that this act shall not apply to marriage celebrated by a minister of such community according to the rights in use in such community between two parties, both of whom are members of such community. And thereupon, all marriages celebrated between such persons by a minister of such a religion, religious community shall, if all requirements of their personal law have been complied with, be valid and shall be uh, shall have the effect and involve the consequences laid down by such personal law. Now, uh, that, uh, means, uh, uh, that means that the, the substantive law here is the personal law of the community. Uh, this provision should read with section five of, uh, of the Civil Procedure Act. This provision, as it originally featured in the enactment of Civil Procedure Code of 1900, and all its reenactments through thereafter, prior to 1974, reads as follows. Where in any suit or other proceeding in a civil court, any question arises regarding succession, inheritance, wills, legacies, gifts, marriage, divorce, family relations, or the constitution of wax endowment, the rule of decision shall be any custom applicable to the parties concerned which is not contrary to justice, equity, or good conscience, and has not been by this or any other enactment altered or abolished, and has not been declared void by the decision of a competent court. B, the Sharia law in cases where the parties are Muslims, except so far as it has been modified by such custom as is above referred to. So uh, there was no personal law, neither for Muslims nor for non-Muslims at the time. And the, uh, the legislature actually uh, relied very much in both cases on customary law without ignoring altogether uh, the, uh, the religious laws of the parties. So it was in a way balanced, favoring Islam only because the Sharia courts did not in any way accept any challenge to Sharia uh, rules. Uh, but it is, it is not something in the law itself. So, but for, for non-Muslims, uh, 
the, the, the problem re remains, you see, we need to look into the case law. In the very old law of Abdullah Sharshafiya, which is a very famous uh, uh, precedent that set the rule here, uh, uh, government judge delivering the judgment of the court said that it has been decided in, that, in this court that where parties are domiciled in a country other than Sudan, which possesses a national law of personal status, that, sh that such law is to be regarded as a body of customs applicable to the parties within the meaning of Section 5. The law of the domicile is in these matters adopted by the law of Sudan as their personal law. But where the parties are uh, domiciled in Sudan or in a country with no national law of personal status, then it has been held it is the custom of the religious community to which they belong, which are to be looked to and comp comprise their uh, personal law. Now, uh, this, uh, this uh, precedent stayed and was accepted by everybody. Only when Lindsay, Chief Justice, uh, pointed out that this has a very serious repercussion in Bambulis versus Bambulis, which is a, also another uh, I will read his uh, words here. Custom is established usage, which by recognition in Sudan court of law requires the force of law. The section envisages that such custom can be altered or even abolished or declared void. The ecclesiastical rules of a church and civil law of foreign countries are, in, in my view, incapable of being altered, abolished, or declared void, and clearly not contemplated by the wording of the section to be within the meaning of the word custom. This only case uh, was never uh, followed uh, later on. Uh, soon after, Qatan versus Qatan uh, uh, took us back to, to the old rule and that was uh, also uh, co uh, confirmed by Maurice Go Goldenberg versus Rachel Goldenberg. And these cases are very, uh, are well known uh, uh, in uh, the personal law for non-Muslim. Okay, then we go to section 12 of uh, non-Muslim ma uh, marriage act. Um, section 12 say every marriage validly celebrated under this act or under any of the ordinance hereby repealed uh, shall continue and subsist until one of the parties thereto shall die or until it shall be dissolved by a decree of nullity or of divorce uh, pronounced by a court of competent uh, jurisdiction. In 1972, this section was amended by adding to it the following provision, provided always that if the husband becomes an adherent of the Islamic faith, and by reason of such adherence, his personal status comes to be governed by Sharia law, such marriage shall continue to subsist but may be dissolved in accordance with the Sharia law. That is to give the husband the right to divorce at will. Notwithstanding the subsistence of such marriage, it shall be lawful for the husband to marry another wife or other wives in accordance with Sharia law, provided also that if the husband becomes an adherent of Islamic faith, but the wife does not, and the husband marries or purports to marry another wife during uh, that marriage, then whether or not his personal status 
shall have come to be governed by Sharia law, it shall be lawful for the province court to dissolve such marriage on petition and petition of the wife. It, it, so uh, uh, it says that it will be lawful for the province court. It is not mandatory for the province court to uh, to accept the application by the wife. The wife, but it can do that. Uh, well, uh, well, no, Alas, I'll go, I'll go on, I'll go on. Uh, I, I think I don't want to point out the the importance of all of this. You, you, you must deduct them yourself. Okay. Effect of adopting Sharia on. I will leave that. The reception of the common law and civil law of Sudan achieved gradually by British and other common law trained judges. But few substantive civil laws were, co uh, were codified before 1974. Most of the civil laws, including the laws of contract agency and sale of goods, were non existent. So judges had to rely on Section 9 of the Civil Justice Ordinance to find the rules. Section 9 reads as follows, in cases not provided for by this or any other enactment for the time being enforced, the court shall act according to justice, equity, and good conscience. This was always interpreted by the courts to mean common law and the English statutory law as well. After independence, the fact that a foreign legislature was legislating for the country was not acceptable as a result of the rising patriotic feeling. When the court, court started to refuse to apply the English statutory law, the Court of Appeal refused to approve that outright rejection and decided that courts were applying not the letter of the English statutory law, but the idea of justice behind it. It follows from that that such application was by no means an automatic application. There are cases to show that, but maybe after the break. <laughs> so uh, in 1970, a new civil code was enacted under the influence of Babikar Awadallah. Uh, that was taken from the Egyptian law. The ill-fated civil court was, uh, uh, was repealed in, um, one year, after one year. And 1974 witnessed wide legislative activity, activity to reform the laws and to fill the vacuum therein. Some substantive laws were enacted, like, OK, and this all. Uh, This was uh, followed by certain uh, call for, it was based, of course, on common law, on either uh, relying on Egyptian law or on Sharia law. It, it is, it is uh, interesting to, lo to know that uh, uh, I, will, uh, I will quote here no other person than Jalal Ali Lutfi, the former chief justice under the first years of Al-Inqaz. He wrote in 1967, in my opinion, pure Mohammedan law, excluding the personal law, which is applied to mis Muslims alone, cannot be the sole law in Sudan. First, because as I have stated before, it is not detailed code to be applied with the exception of very few express provisions it is a code of general principles from which some laws but not all laws, laws required uh, can be derived secondly owing to the well established idea in the minds of nearly all muslim that islamic law and religion are in an integral part it is very difficult to carry out any sort of drastic reform to them, any change is considered as transgression and violation of the sacred principles of religion. 
Thirdly, in this country, we have our own local problems. The people of Sudan are not all Muslims. We have Christians as well as pagans who will no doubt object if uh, all the laws applied are based on Sharia law and less is nothing else. His conclusion was, from what I have briefly explained, if the situation is considered objectively, the English law will no doubt continue as the, ma the main guidance for our future legal development. But if the trend is to follow opinion and ideas tainted and colored with sentiment and emotions, then any change to a different si system will serve no purpose other than the temporary political gain by those who are advocating it. If this unnecessary change has taken place, and I hope not, the result will definitely be a disastrous one. This conclusion proved to be prophetic, but when the new rulers in 1989 decided to follow opinions and ideas described by him as tainted and colored with sentiment and emotions, they found no one other than the same Jalal al Lutfi to appoint as the Chief Justice. And he, of course, obliged. Yes. In, in the CPA, the, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, uh, that brought uh, about the Constitution of 2005, there was a lot of discussion and haggling about the apply application of Sharia on non-Muslims. And uh, they, uh, they came with the most uh, unfortunate, you see, solution. I will, uh, I, I will go into the status of the capital because the, the SPLA was ready to accept Sharia in the north. But they said, what about the national capital? We, we have our shares there. So uh, of course, for uh, the government, it, they c could not hear of abolishing Sharia anywhere in the country. So uh, <coughs> they came with this solution. They brought about the, the section, uh, the, the chapter in the Constitution titled the National Capital. Uh, uh, what is important here is that everybody agreed that applying Sharia ah was adversely affecting the rights of non-Muslims to the extent that special provision, provisions should be provided to solve the problem. The fact that the application of these provisions was limited to the capital amounts to condoning discrimination against non-Muslims in the rest of the northern parts of the country. Thus, Section 157 of the Constitution directed the presidency to establish the institution called the presidency comprised the three, uh, the president and his two uh, vice president, to establish special commission for the rights of non-Muslims in the national capital, to ensure that non-Muslims are not adversely affected by the application of Sharia law in the national capital. Uh, moreover, as an additional guarantee, section 155, Four stipulates human rights and fundamental freedoms as specified in this constitu constitution, including respect of all religions, beliefs, customs being of particular significance in the national capital, which symbolizes national unity shall be guaranteed and enforced in the national capital. The whole idea here regarding the national capital is that the Constitution acknowledges that application of Sharia is affecting uh, adversely non-Muslims. And in order to, to make that, uh, to make up for that, it, it, chooses, it, chose, it chooses only 
the national capital. And with very, very uh, unrealistic, uh, you see, uh, provisions. Like, I will have to read this. Uh, this is the end of it. Okay, right. Behavior based on cultural practices and traditions, which does not disturb public order, is not disdainful of other traditions, and not in violation of the law shall be deemed in the eyes of the law as an exercise of personal freedom. This allow, uh, amounts to nothing. Nothing is said here. Because if you, if you say acts that does not break the law is not punishable, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. So I have to go to the conclusion in order not to but you read the conclusion. This is not the conclusion. The conclusion <laughs> here is, uh, I, no, khalas. if you don't want khalas. a conclu no, conclusion, I leave it. All of that practices and laws, because uh, I, I did not have time to, to, to speak about practice. All of that is causing an increased fear in the Christian minds and concern. I must say this, and concern within the population at large, as the average Sudanese Muslim is very tolerant towards religious differences. And the social life in the country remains free of any discrimination based on religion. It would be sad if the very smooth and friendly relations between Sudanese Muslims and Sudanese Christians that distinguish Sudan from other Middle Eastern countries are allowed to wither away in favor of extremism. Thank, Thank you. you very much.